Praise God. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the Footscray Church, they did a tremendous job. Amen. You know, we've all been thinking about long service, haven't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> I was trying to add it up. You know, I'm just, uh, my wife and I are hitting 37 years in the ministry. And so I'm kind of working it out and I was thinking about it, but a Bible verse came to me. So I want to just uh, share that for all those <laughs> that are thinking about that. 2 Kings 5, 26. You can look that up in your own time, but a bit of a hint. <laughs> Part of it says, is it a time to receive money? <laughs> As Elijah said to Gehazi. So let's, um, let's have a look at Joshua 1, 2 through 5. It was the 9th of February, 1709, and the pastor's house the residency of the Wesley family caught a light. It was around midnight. Some have different thoughts about how did this fire begin. Some thought that it might have even been deliberately lit. However, Samuel uh, uh, Wesley and Susanna and their seven children were in the house. The Reverend Samuel Wesley as his pastor, he awakens, he sees what's going on, he shouts fire, fire. He opens his bedroom door, he finds out the uh, corridor's full of smoke. He awoke his wife and their two eldest daughters and begin to get them out of the house. Then the pastor then uh, ran to the uh, nursery rooms. Uh, there was a maid there, wake, woke her up to remove the other five children. It was interesting as the father was there, young Charles Wesley, he picked up on his arms, just a young boy and took him out. And as they got out of the house, he realised as he did a head count, one of my children is still missing. One of my children is still missing and it's young John Wesley. Young John Wesley had slept through it all. He wasn't aware of what was going on. He finally awoke because he saw the light of the blaze getting larger and hotter. He cried out. He heard also cries from the street outside his house. It's interesting, the dad saw him in the upper level, ran back into the house. But as he goes into the house to go up the stairs, it begins to collapse under the weight of the fire and there's no way he can get up there to reach his son. He falls in the living room of his house that's burning around and said, God, I commend the soul of my son to you. He has to remove. John is now panicking. He goes to the door. He can't get out of his door. The flame is there. He goes to the window. He stands on a cupboard, uh, uh, basically to be able to look out the window. And as he's crying out, uh, people see them. They cry, bring a ladder. But there was not enough time to bring a ladder. So what they did instead is they formed a human ladder. There's a picture here that I'll bring up. They had a man that stood on other people's shoulders to rescue someone and save that young five-year-old John Wesley. One man stood upon the soldiers' shoulders of another to reach further than they could ever reach by themselves. John Wesley, years later, thankfully he survived. Interesting, when they plucked him out, as soon as they plucked him out, that whole floor collapsed. A moment later, he would have perished. He believed that he was a brand plucked from the very burning and he was saved for a purpose. Thank you for that photo. And I was thinking about that for a moment and I'm gonna preach for a few minutes on the Joshua generation. And what brought about the rescue was a man who stood on the shoulders of others to reach further than they could reach by themselves. This is what I believe the Joshua generation is. It's a generation that stands on the shoulders of others to be able to go further and to reach further. 
Let's have a look at Joshua 1, uh, verse 2 through 5. Bible says, this is our text of our conference. I want to use this. Moses, my servant is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given you, as I've said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. You wanna look at the Joshua generation, a generation that stands on the shoulders of others to reach further. When I consider, first of all, how you live your life, how I live my life today. You know, tragically, we're in, I believe, a very selfish generation. The Bible says and prophesies this in 2 Timothy, Timothy 3, 2, for men will be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. You know, I read this article, it says, what are you and what would best describe you? It talked about, you know, ski generation, dinkos, dinos, sink. Let me read a few of these. A sink is a single income, no kids. A dinky is a double income, no kids yet. A dinker is a double income, no kids, early retirement. A dino is a double income, no options. A Henry, high earner, not rich yet. Some of us are Henrys. Then there's a wolf, well off older folks. And then the ski is the spending kids inheritance. You know, one man writes in this article, says, I wanna give you five reasons why you should spend your kids' inheritance now or go skiing. He said, number one, his perspective, life's too short to delay having fun. Number two, there's a 50% chance your kids will blow the money. Number three, your children won't remember the stuff. Number four, to develop your children's values. Number five, to avoid legal cost delays and challenges to your will, best to leave nothing. You know, the biblical record speaks of a king called Hezekiah. In many ways, we read his story and we see Hezekiah's a good man. He's a good king. Actually, you know, in 2 Kings chapter 20, he had just received a very negative word from the man of God. Get your house in order. Your, day, your days are up. Your life's coming to an end. And the Bible says the king turned his face uh, to the wall and he began to cry out to God, says, oh God, I've been faithful, I've served you, I've honoured you, I've, I've done your will. Would you heal me? Would you help me? Would you extend my life? And the man of God who just given him the Word turns around and hears the Word of God and tells him, listen, God's heard your prayer. Turn things around. God's adding 15 more years to your life. So a Word of God came. It's time for you to go. He prays and reverses the Word of God. Very powerful. Do you know, you just read the next few verses after this and we hear there's an envoy from Babylon. He shows them all, all the kingdom and uh, you, you know the story. And the prophet said, who are these people? People from uh, Babylon. And it's interesting, Isaiah says to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming uh, that all that's in your house that your fathers had accumulated to this day shall be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left says the Lord, they shall take some of your sons who will descend from you, whom will you, you will beget, uh, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you've spoken is good. For he said, will there not be peace and truth at least in my day? You know, this is in one chapter. So he had a negative word about himself. He prayed and he turned the outcomes. He hears now a negative word about his children and his children's children. And he says, it's good. And he says, at least there's prosperity and 
peace in my day. You begin to think something's wrong here. Can you say amen? And this man, you know, Hezekiah, you read him on the holies. Quite a good king he has been. But you're thinking, here he is, as long as I'm okay, everything's all right. He just had a miracle reversal. And I wondered, why didn't he pray for another miracle reversal? We think of first generation believers, people that have come in from the world and got saved, come into our churches and come out of Egypt, you could say. No doubt uh, having an incredible saving from the world. But isn't it strange that a mentality could grip us sometimes, uh, amen, uh, and think uh, to ourselves, to the next generations and the generations after, well, listen, I've had it hard and so should you. I started with nothing. Why should it be any different for you? Actually, it'd be good for you. Do you know the terrible outcome of Hezekiah is that Hezekiah's son that took over from him in the lineage to become the next king was a man named Manasseh and Manasseh was the worst, most wicked king that the nation of Judah ever had. Is there a connection between the two? Is there a connection between Hezekiah his attitude towards the next generation and how it turns out? We need to have a passion for the next generation or we could perhaps lose them. You know, the Bible is encouragement in Proverbs 13, verse 22. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. There's something good and positive about that. You know, we're enjoying such a rich time today in our conference, you know, packed in here, packed in the prayer room, multitudes watching live stream. It's a wonderful work of God. All our churches are growing, thank God. There's an expansion, there's a blessing, there's a thrust, you can feel it. Uh, but you know, there was a day where all that was at risk. I remember coming back from New Zealand in 207, coming back to Perth here. And I began to see that there was a diversion and a change, that a leader was going in another direction. You know, I'd experienced revival. I got saved in a powerful work of God. God had so touched me, it filled me with the Holy Ghost, gave me direction. I had a future in God. But when I saw what this man's doing, he's robbing our next generation. Something deeply affected me. If this man continues to do what he's doing, there will be no future for our children and our children's children in revival. Thankfully, as you know, Pastor Wayman came in 209 and things began to change in Pastor Payne, a reset moment. But that was what's at stake. What's at stake is the next generation. You know, the Bible talks in Genesis 21, 33, and Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Bathsheba and he called upon the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. So the Bible includes just an interesting statement about planting a tree. Why did it include it? What's important about that? And it's interesting as you ponder that. I believe planting a tree in many ways is planting something that will outlive you that'll provide shelter, not perhaps uh, some trees, not even in your own lifetime, but will provide shelter, fuel, and that tree, medicine. They say the bark of it was used for medicine for many generations. Most good things take more than one generation to reach their ultimate fulfilment, blessing and triumph. Our text begins in Joshua 1.1. 1, 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, uh, saying. So, you know, our story in Joshua doesn't necessarily start with Joshua and his generation. It starts with Moses, the servant of the Lord. 
the concluding previous chapter in Deuteronomy 37 verse 10. But since there had not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face in all the signs and wonders the Lord had sent him to do in the land of Egypt before Pharaoh, before his servants and in the land and all his mighty power and all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. So here's Moses. It really starts Joshua, the book of Joshua starts effectively with Moses and his generation. Moses took Joshua's assistant, imparted into another man, the next generation, his life, his spirit. You know, as opposing the story or the opposite story or the antithesis of Hezekiah, I think is the story of King David. You know, David had in his heart And the Bible says God didn't even necessarily inspire him, but it was because he had a heart for God. He wanted to build God a house. He wanted to build a, a temple unto the Lord. And the prophet Nathan come and said, yeah, do all this in your heart. But as he walks away, God speaks to him and says, no, you go back and tell David that he's not to build it, but rather his son is to build it. And so what did David do? He said, well, I can't see it all. If he was like Hezekiah, he would uh, get very upset because it's all about me. But what did David do? The Bible says in 1 Chronicles 22 verse 5, now David said, Solomon, my son is young and inexperienced and the house to build for the Lord is an exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious through all countries. I will now make preparation for it. So David made abundant preparations before his death. Uh, Amen. So this is what we're looking at. David is the actual opposite. The Bible says that he charged, number one, charged and instructed his son. He told his son the story of what God had spoken to him. He showed vision and he began to speak about your task now, son. Number two, he prepared with money and resources. The opposite of the ski generation. He stored up money for another generation. Number three, he used his influence to help others flow and follow his son. It started in David's heart, the building of the temple. It was never fulfilled in his generation. David never saw in this life the house of God that was in his heart fulfilled. He had a vision for it. But what did David do? His latter years of his life, the Bible is very clear. He gave his latter years to help another generation fulfil that vision. To establish something that would benefit others down the road of life. Building and sowing for another generation. Can I ask you a question? Are you planting something that will outlast you? Are you sowing something that's gonna live beyond you? Would you allow other people to stand on your shoulders, would you bear their weight so they can reach further than you? They can go further than you? One of the largest news organisations and media organisations in the world is News Corp and Fox Corporation. Do you know, that's not a one generation event An Australian named Sir Keith Murdoch was a war correspondent in the First World War. Then he started a regional newspaper. He had a couple in Adelaide. He started a radio station. He was the chairman of the Herald and the Weekly Times. And in the process of time, he died and he handed that to his son, Rupert Murdoch, on his shoulders, went and built something that is all over the world. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? Most things are not fulfilled in one generation. Most good things take more than one generation to see their ultimate fulfilment and blessing. We want to then move and look at another generation. A gifted people, the story in the book of Joshua is about a generation born free. Those who'd not lived under the sting of the lash of slavery all the world. 
Maybe for us, it's maybe those that didn't live with an alcoholic father or an absent father. Those that didn't uh, brought up with a, a mother that's suffering from severe mental challenges. Maybe a generation that didn't have abusive relatives coming around. The Bible says their fathers in uh, Exodus 3 verse 7, and the Lord said to them, I've certainly seen the oppression of the people uh, in Egypt. I've heard their cries of distress, the harshness uh, of the slave drivers. Yes, I'm aware of their suffering, the New Living Translation said. So a new generation, the Joshua generation, they know nothing of slavery. They were born free. No doubt that here, uh, perhaps dad recount some stories of the lash, of building the treasure cities, of the oppression, but still it's somewhat distant from them. It's never been their experience. Every now and then they might catch a glimpse of when dad takes off his shirt and they still see the lashes marks on his back. But then they move on with life. They're born free and no doubt having benefits that the previous generation never had. A stable home educational opportunities perhaps, a sense of love and belonging, perhaps uh, promises of blessing. How many times do I hear at a breakfast table you know, with men or discipleship of some of the older pastors, older brothers, they say time and time again, I would to God that I was taught this as a young disciple pastor. Would to God that I had that and no doubt that is true. But the question we ask tonight what does a generation that born free do with that blessing? What are you going to do with that? What's the Joshua generation going to do with the gifts and even the callings of God? There's a choice no doubt to make. Sure, you have your own struggles. And we know you're brought up in the house of God. Maybe you've gone to church since you were born. Mum and dad brought you in, thank God, into the house of God. What a great honour and great privilege. Can you say amen? How many know that you could come to church but never be saved? Number one. You could have no personal saving faith yourself. And how many know we all have sin nature? Sin nature doesn't get any better when you get older. Actually, it gets worse. So if you're not converted in the church, you're actually only going to get worse because sin nature only gets worse as we get older. But the other problem is you could be hearing altar call after altar call and you harden your heart. You say, no, 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 no. And you say no enough to God. You could have a calloused heart, a hard heart. Do you know, for many raw sinners that come in and they hear the gospel for the first time, they go, whoa, my gosh, and they're, they're struck to the heart. What must we do to be saved? But you've heard it 10,000 times. Oh, you need to be saved. You could treat holy things with disrespect. The altar, the offering, the preaching. So that's the struggle that a Joshua generation could have. The second struggle could be distraction. The very freedom that you've been born in, the very gifts of God that's been given to you, you could be challenged to not use them for God and for others, but for you. Do you know, Jesus was even tempted this way, wasn't He? One of the temptations of the the devil, Satan, as he came uh, to Jesus and he says to him, uh, if you are the son of God, turn these stones and make them become bread. Use your gifting and calling for yourself. I mean, that's a challenge. No doubt you have, many have better school outcomes. Just not having uh, all the media in your house constantly will give you better school outcomes. Encouraging your kids to read. Maybe to sit still a little bit in church and focus every now and then. Your kids will have a mile of advantage over most other children. 
They'll have a confidence. They can interact with an older generation. Your parents get them, you say hi, you have fellowship, you do all those things. They're miles ahead. But you could use that very thing. They could, that could be in business. You could be miles ahead in business. You could be miles ahead, you know, in different, you know, in avenues. And listen, some of that's legitimate. But if it's not God's call for you and you're using it on self, there's a challenge. What about the challenge of not connecting to the older generation? We know about the generational gap and generational tension. And we understand that you could... Uh, begin to resent an older generation, that old dinosaur, he's so out of touch. (laughs) But I want to ponder in this second point is bring this part to a close, standing on the shoulders of others. In verse five it says, no one shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. So Joshua is standing on Moses' uh, sh- uh, generation's shoulder. This is the Joshua generation. Why God planned it that way, that they could reach further. They could go further. They could have greater impact. And you know, there's such a power in the Kingdom of God. I think the devil has a vested interest to separate generations the younger people to think the older people are so out of touch, the older people to think the younger people are useless. Right? Caught up in just silly things. I think the devil has a vested interest to keep the generations apart. But when there's a union of generations... It's interesting, the last verse in the Old Testament speaks of now a new work of God that He's going to do in the New Testament dispensation. And it actually says in the very last verse in Malachi 4 verse 5, and I'll send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. A union of generations a joining of generation. Think about it on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached in Acts 2 verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. It mentions in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, both generations are working together. There's a partnership of generations, there's a union of generations. In the last book of the law that Moses wrote, we see in Deuteronomy 34, one and uh, verse four, that God showed Moses all the land, all the promised land. He said, I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over. So Moses saw it, but he never entered it. He saw it, you could say, spiritually. Maybe God took him in the spirit. God showed him, this is the land, but he never entered into the land. He had a vision for it. But he prepared others to go in. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 34 verse 9, Now Joshua the son of Nun was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Why? Because Moses laid hands on him. An older generation imparted to a newer generation. So the children of Israel heeded him. Words given, promises imparted, personal influence. In our text, every place the sole of your foot shall tread, I will give to you as I've said to Moses. He links both generations together. I've made a promise to Moses' generation. I've given them promises. But listen, they've seen it. Or they begin to enter in, but you are gonna take the land. You are gonna be the people. Pastor Nigel Brown spoke of our pastor speaking in 1978 at the Four Square Convention about this church and this city and this nation. He says, oh, if you could feel what I feel when I came to Western Australia. A nation that speaks English, thank God for that. 
probably one of the greatest opportunities on the face of the earth today. I went into city after city. I saw the stronghold city of Perth, cities of 25, 35,000 without a single full gospel church in it. No vibrant witness for the Son of God. And my heart leapt within me and my heart throbbed. I said, oh God, that we have men and women, Lord, that could reach those cities. We have men and women that could be challenged. Spirit of God, breathe upon the church and let us know the urgency of the hours into all the world. We do not have forever to preach the Gospel, but time is running out. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Last conference, at the end of our last conference, Pastor Greg prophesied and he talked about a body of water. He says, if you notice a body of water, you see a wave that goes out and then it kind of hits a bank and it comes back and he began to speak and prophesy as you give out to church planting, to helping other churches. I mean, a wave will go out, but it'll come back to bless couples and finances and he finishes off and said don't ever stop giving out what about you are you giving out I want to bring it to a close in good success in Joshua 1 verse 2 it says Moses my servant's dead now arise and go over the Jordan you and all this people to the land I'm giving to them the children of Israel Wesley's commentary says it goes to actual possessing it, where it was formerly a right given by a promise. So what he's saying, it's now entering a new phase of actuality. It's actually now happening. It's no longer a theory. It's no longer just a promise. We're beginning to live and experience this. This is what he's beginning to say. And uh, Joshua chapter one, God challenges the Joshua generation. Be strong and be courageous. Uh, Lord, give us men of faith. Uh, Give us men that are willing to fight. Give us men who can finish. I wanna ask a question as we bring this to a close. How many of you are in ministry? You're a pastor, you're an evangelist, you're a missionary and your parents were pastors, evangelists or missionaries before you. I want you to stand up. Stand up. You're a pastor or a missionary now or evangelist, but your parents. I want to expand it a bit more. You're a pastor, a missionary or evangelist. Your parents weren't necessarily pastors, missionaries or evangelists, but they were saved. In the, you, you stand up as well. Wow, hallelujah, can you say amen? Praise God. Man, we, I thank God for, let's give them a hand, these wonderful people. Yes, yes. Oh God, thank you Jesus. Praise God. How exciting. And you look around, you see leaders in our fellowship missionaries, evangelists, pastors that are doing great things for God. No doubt as a last day's generation, we're uniquely placed to get the job done. We have promises, we have know-how, we have the wisdom of our forefathers. And as I bring it to a close, I believe the Joshua generation is a generation that can change the world that can change the world. I wanna first of all challenge the older generation. Don't live the rest of your life for yourself. Don't be a ski spiritually. Don't spend all your kids' spiritual inheritance on whatever selfishness you feel, but think about others. The wisdom, the blessing, the knowledge, the insight, the life experience that you have, the resources that you have. I wanna challenge our older generation to commit like David committed himself. The latter years of his life, he spent to make it easier for Solomon to build the great house of God. I wanna challenge the older generation, planning, money, backing. I wanna challenge the Joshua generation. How would I define that? A Joshua generation. I would probably, I want to, I'll put a marker. I would say those that are 40 and under. The Moses generation, no doubt, is probably 
41 and older. I just made that up. I want to speak to the Joshua generation. In our text, this is a prophetic type. Moses brought them out of Egypt. He brought them out of the, under the power of darkness, the world. He led them by mighty hand. But he never went fully into the promised land. It's the next generation. No doubt Moses' generations had great victories, great dominion, great power. Hallelujah. And usually one generation is not long enough to truly see a great work completed. I believe in as a fellowship now, we're a multi-generational project of God. God is doing a powerful thing. It says in our text, uh, Joshua 1 verse 8, uh, then you'll have good success. Joshua, you dedicate yourself. Pastor Greg spoke about this, about the Word of God. He talks about meditating, loving God's Word, praying for a love for people and a passion for souls, being on fire for God. You know, as we bring it to the conclusion, the whole book of Joshua ends uh, basically Joshua eleven twenty three. 23. So Joshua took the whole land. A book about a generation that were born free. They didn't know uh, the terrible wickedness of sin and the oppression uh, like uh, their forefathers brought in wonderfully, had a platform, uh, amen, to go forward and reach further, stood on others' shoulders. Uh, and the Bible says that generation took the land. You know, going back to John Wesley, five years old, saved People stood on people's shoulders to rescue him. Otherwise, he wouldn't have made it. You know, he come of age. He followed in his father's footsteps. His father was a pastor. He went to study in the Church of England and, you know, got his degrees and quite a, quite a well-to-do family. Anyway, brought up in a Christian home, he decides to go and do, does a trip to America to reach the native uh, uh, Indigenous uh, Indians there. Goes there and no one gets saved comes back and is discouraged and you know he meets some certain uh, people, the Moravians on the ship back there and they were in a great storm and he was fearful that he was gonna sink and die and maybe go to hell and they seemed to have some uh, uh, confidence in life and he began to inquire about them and they began to speak about you need to be born again. Says a Joshua generation, educated, smart, good parents but the problem was John Wesley wasn't saved. He talks about the story uh, uh, in May 24th, uh, how uh, I mean, after failing to be a missionary, he comes back and has a major conversion experience at Anders Gate in London. He's come to the revelation by grace you're saved through faith. Uh, God, by the Holy Spirit, came into his heart. Uh, amen. He began to come on fire for God. Listen. When the Joshua generation gets saved and gets the vision, they change the world. John Wesley changed the world of his day. Do you know, here in Australia, we're a recipient of that. The Methodist movement that came out of John Wesley's life impacted Australia. Our first uh, chaplains uh, that came to New South Wales, uh, yes, they were Church of England, but they were part of the Methodist movement. They were impacted by the evangelistic gospel. The man Samuel Marsden who went to New Zealand was the same. Throughout all the Pacific Islands, uh, this uh, generation uh, that were come to the revelation under John Wesley of saved by grace uh, and reaching the world began to spread out over the whole world in their generation. You know, there's an Englishman named John Hunt. He was 16 years old and he nearly died of brain fever. He survived, he began to dig into his life and he went to a church, a Methodist church, and he got born again. And in that environment, he heard other missionaries are going to other parts of the world. He felt stirred 
to come to the Pacific. He sailed from England, come to Sydney, and then that was a base, and he went to the islands, the Fiji Islands. Let me just read a little bit. Here he is, 26 years old. He's a missionary, not on a plane by boat. Six months to get over. When he reached the Fiji Islands, he found out uh, that the stories of a terrible paganism in those places were true. Two thirds of all the children were boiled and eaten. Every village had a human butcher. Aged parents were eaten by their children. And he goes on, just the paganism. The cannibalism. And he began to preach the gospel at 26 years old. And God began to move. It said that hundreds, then thousands of people embraced Jesus Christ under the preaching of a 20 year old John Hunt. The cultures of those islands changed so dramatically as cannibalism ceased. Churches emerged from the pagan wreckage and the tradition of gospel witnesses, witness continues to this very day. What about you? What about the Joshua generation this morning? This evening rather. He's a 26 year old that goes in and changes a nation for God. I believe when this generation gets it, like John Wesley, with all the blessing that they have, God's uniquely positioned them to change the world. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heads bowed and eyes are closed.